I have the distinct honor and pleasure to introduce to you uh, the results of a very exciting initiative that uh, Maritime Forces Pacific asked APCSS to support um, that involved the inclusion, the meaningful inclusion of some junior officers into your very um, strategic level discussion. APCSS and Maritime Forces Pacific convened a group that spans from Cambodia to Chile of 14 of the most promising young officers that their organizations could nominate. So on Sunday morning, very early, after thousands of miles of travel, 14 uh, ambitious and talented young people from 11 countries um, gathered together to run a scenario exercise that was designed and written by another promising young person, Mr. Dan Bart, who works here on the Amos staff and for Dr. Jim Boutillier. Collectively, they represented the governments of Australia, Brunei, Cambodia, Canada, Chile, Indonesia, Japan, Malaysia, the Philippines, the United States, and Vietnam. They're all maritime professionals, but they are also diverse in their professional approaches to the sea. They're drawn from regional navies, coast guards, ministries of defense, ministries of foreign affairs, and Marine Police. The faculty, uh, Commander Odom and I, who had the pleasure of working with them all day on Saturday, were collectively very impressed with how easily they embraced the com a comprehensive approach to strategy design and how comfortably they shared perspectives despite their diversity. So um, we are sure that you are going to find the insights that they're going to present to you this morning as interesting as we did. So for six hours on Sunday, they were asked to role play a United Nations mission, providing recommendations to a country recently emerging from conflict and facing an array of challenges, both resource-based, military-based, non-traditional in nature, and realistic constraints in terms of their budget and available uh, capabilities. We're not gonna ask them to present their recommendations on that fictional scenario to you. What we are and what we have asked them to do is draw from that simulation to distill the key lessons learned that they um, came to based on their fresh perspectives and to share those key lessons learned with you as a way of providing, I think, either a validation or a counterpoint to some of the insights already gained among you, the senior group. So they're going to present to you the answers to three questions this morning. First, what does comprehensive maritime strategy mean from their perspective? Second, what tools and powers do national governments have at their disposal or should they make better use of as support to the development of their own sea power? And last, and perhaps most interestingly, at least for me, how is maritime security changing as we look into the future? So it's one thing to talk about the future, which we've done. This morning, we're going to get the opportunity to talk with the future. Uh, and with that, I'm going to turn it over to our first speaker, uh, Sensa, from the Indonesian Navy, is going to talk to us about comprehensive maritime strategy. Duty to Intimacy Ray, Honorable Ambassadors, Principal of the KKA, Moderator and All Participant Maritime Challenge 2016 at School Media Canada. Today, your day, there's a wisdom word that I will never forget when I was cadet from my senior in NFL Academy. And now I realize that every day is grace from God because it is an honor I'm standing here, sharing knowledge and experience and snitching ballroom and a fantastic country which famous for the handsome, young and brilliant inspiring Prime Minister. 
Mr. Justin Bieber, it's true. Why I'm fascinating with the Prime Minister? Because also women and girls from Indonesia know well, and other him a lot. That's opening. And today, I will define how to define a comprehensive marketing strategy. How do we define a comprehensive maritime strategy? Nowadays, the maritime strategy has changed and transformed from the basic definition. If we learn from Webster Dictionary, strategy is defined as a plan or action or policy designed to achieve a major or overall aim. And maritime is defined with all things and that related with nautical, naval sea, oceanic, seafaring, marine, which is connected with the sea, even commercial or military activity. And here, for the end, we are defining that the aim is a critical before we developing the maritime strategy, because the aim of the maritime strategy it is a <coughs> prosperity, positive dominant, existence and stability of the region. Primarily focus on sporting national security, but also as a nice responsibility nation, also care about the international security. And the important economic trade corridor and structural investment and also resource security. And from this place it is to be a national interest, but sometimes it comes second behind other core interests or existence. Because every nation has every interest and political will that is different based on the geopolitics and co uh, constellation on the region. And also the style of from the leader can be influenced then from the strategy from nation. And the core is aimed at building a confidence in the system. How comprehensive maritime strategy can run well, can sustain maritime security to all of the region, which include the sovereignty, constabulary, and also sustain a prosperity from the maritime economy. Ways and means adhere it's come from the multidimensional. We must include and must address a local, national, regional, and global. For multi-agency or inter-agency coordination, military and non-military, and private, industry, non-government organization, <coughs> citizens. And for multi-temporal, continuous iteration in time, adaptive to change. Constable duties are very important and consume many resources. And the last is the heritage, sociocultural of maritime. We can learn and we can Deliver it by the good education with its holistic give motivation to people to appreciate the importance of the sea. Thank you. <coughs> Hello, good morning everyone, ladies and gentlemen. Today I'd like to, attempt to answer the question, what are the powers and 
capabilities available to governments to enhance sea power. So let's move on to the first one. One of the more important ones, I would argue, is through current and established law and policy frameworks. It is a key tool for governments and is instrumental in both supporting domestic and international governance. Here I'd like to echo the statement and recommendation made by Spawning Class yesterday um, about the US where it is hoped that a major power would ratify UNCLOS to further enhance its influence in the Asia Pacific. Next I'm going to talk about diplomacy. So governments can use diplomacy to enhance its power. And this is even more relevant to governments of smaller states, a state such as Brunei. So for example, back in 2013, Brunei chaired the ASEAN summit, and we proposed a direct communications link, which is a hotline between defense ministers. This is to allow ministers to be able to communicate rapidly reliably and also confidentially to prevent any escalation um, in tensions due to the maritime disputes. The proposal was welcomed warmly by the members and was subsequently adopted the next year. So this is just one of the ways in which governments can use diplomacy to enhance its power. Now for the next two points, which is uh, a bit more tangible, so the, to enhance navies and coast guards. We've all heard about the US's um, rebalancing strategy in, in the Asia Pacific. We've also seen how there's a trend in maritime acquisitions in the Asia Pacific. For example, according to the International Institute for Strategic Studies, in Asia about a third and one half of the states have acquired frigates, Corvettes, patrol vessels, patrol boat platforms in the last five years. So you can see a definite trend there. Many countries have also been enhancing the Coast Guard capabilities such as communications and surveillance systems. Now I'd like to explain the next few points together because I think they are inextricably linked. So we have involvement in infrastructure investment, research and development, <coughs> and partnering for capacity. We've heard in the last few days, for example, India's ambitious military modernization program under Prime Minister Narendra Modi about a Make in India policy. And although India has a long way to go, it has worked together with countries such as the US, even China and Australia to share information and learn so that it can develop its own capabilities. Singapore, on the other hand, also has a few challenges. The Defence Minister, Dr. Ng Enghen, stated that demography is the greatest challenge to the country. And by working with its state-owned firms such as SD Marine and SD Engineering, Singapore is addressing these problems through unmanned systems and lean manning. The next point, education and training. I'd like to stress the importance of education and training because no country would like a misalignment in, in its capabilities. So for example, having the ships but not the sailors or the expertise to maintain the ships. And we've heard many um, personal anecdotes from the speakers here such as Admiral Dato Mior from Malaysia and also Sini Katajang uh, of China where the youths nowadays have a diverse range of career options and they share the same problems with same challenges as well in Singapore in recruiting um, personnel. So that's why I think it's crucial for government to educate and spread the importance of education and training to sustain, and to sustain a maritime security strategy for posterity. Thank you.
represent my excellent colleague to, to represent the last question. Uh, is the idea of monetary security changing? Um, the thing is, we found that the, the ideas of monetary security, we have no international consensus on this issue. And we believe that in the past, we usually define the monetary issue in the term of sovereignty or territory integration or interstate dispute or the safety of ship and facility. But uh, when the time changing, we found that a lot of countries uh, redefine it in a broader way, in a broader sense and in comprehensive approach. By comprehensive, uh, I mean that we cover a lot of may, uh, many other aspects that related to the sea, such as uh, local development, which means how to integrate local and coast, coastal provinces in national economy, uh, ecological industry, environmental protection at sea, uh, and energy security and access to resources to at sea uh, or to the seabed. Uh, global climate change, like we usually hear in the conference, and security not of not only of the sailors and fishermen, but also of the coastal pollutants who live near the sea, uh, and maintain the security security of sea land of communication, and more importantly is the privacy or the actions of unlawful. Um, like the illegal fishing or illicit uh, trafficking uh, by the sea. And why there are a lot of many areas or expect emerged when we approach the ideas of maritime security because we found that it's the effect of globalization and also the deglobalization. And when we say that there are a lot of new security challenges arise, this is with us. It's because this is new or it's a right recently. We have two ways to say it's a new security challenge. The first thing is maybe because it's already exists in the past, but when time changing, uh, it changed the way people <laughs> perceive the effect of the way people um, perceive uh, the new challenges, or maybe these issues is uh, developed and it's become more anxious to the people, to the community and to uh, a lot of government or countries around the world. And why I say globalization is a main impact that um, make people change the way they see or the concern of the maritime security. That's it because I found that globalization go in line with interdependent. And when in the area of globalization and interdependent, a lot of countries uh, feel more vulnerable to outside threat. And because of the complexity, interconnectedness of globalization, um, a lot of countries feel that uh, it's increased the complexity of the security challenges in around the world and for every country also. And um, the last thing I want to say that because of globalization, a lot of threats become transnational. It's not in the boundary of a single country anymore, but a lot of countries share the threat and have to co cooperate with each other to deal with the threat. And because of the hybrid in the nature, which is interconnected and in uh, unpredict in unpredictable of the new challenges, so a lot of um, new issues become like. Uh, a lot of new issues get more attention from a lot of country and community as well. And why is I say about the deglobalization? Globalization and deglobalization de globalization is two percent as go with each other. Uh, because when you go globalize, globalize, globalize sometimes some countries feel threat about the process of globalization, so they close their border and. Uh, we have the issues from uh, my colleagues about the deglobalization and how it's a threat to my town security because of the immigration in some countries that shut down the border and the refugees just like they go around anywhere uh, around the, uh, the sea and like they have no no land to 
can shoot in my in, in way and it will come back to you at the country. We want to attack the refugees, for example, at the case you see in Europe now today. And that's not everything that I want I, I want to represent my group to say to the audience and thank you very much.
I want to add some point. I personally think that which what was added is the most priority is very much depend on which country you are. Because I think that um, depend on the power or the capability that a country has, they can define the, the goals or the aim very different. For example, if you are a developing country with not, not a lot of power, you should just go like the DSC and some go like economic development. But if you are a big power like the US, Japan or China, you need it. You want to go to the Farsi and international security, for example. So it's hard to say that it was a priority we should move first because it's context depend and uh, depend on the country. Yeah, we'd just like to add. It is true that it is a changing world and nothing is ever static anymore. And although we have different goals and probably priorities for different countries, I would say that when you come up with a comprehensive maritime strategy, it should be adapted. It should be able to survive. It should be robust. So I would liken this to a um, to the human um, the immune system, something that has brought us here for hundreds and thousands of years. The white blood cells they continue to attack foreign threats, viruses continue to adapt, even though flus have mutated many, many different times, but it's continue to provide the best defense for the human body. So that's why. Thank you. Thank you. So specific, tailored to national needs and dynamic and adaptive. That's your homework for our future.